Alex Greenwald. I am so excited to sit down with you today. I feel like it's been so long since we've been able to have one of these chats, so I'm excited to get back into it today. I would just love to get to know you all over again. Can you tell me a little <laughs> bit about what you do here at the museum? Yeah, so I'm a curator of ethnography, and ethnography is the study of living peoples or uh, people who have lived recently uh, using historical records. Um, so one of the things I focus on is the uh, living native people who live in Western North America. Um, many people have this conception of native people as being gone, uh, and they are very much still present and contributing uh, to their own cultures and to our society as a whole. Um, so I study um, a lot of their material objects, so um, the beautiful art they make and the continuity with that art uh, from now and far back in time, because I'm also an archaeologist. Is ethnography a part of anthropology or archaeology or a little bit of both? Um, ethnography has traditionally been sort of the core method that cultural anthropologists use to understand living people. Um, and as an archaeologist, it's also really important and has become more important in our methods as we listen to contemporary Native people and their perspectives on their ancestors. And it can also help us inform uh, the questions we ask about the past. Like we can get really important insights from contemporary people um, and generate hypotheses and predictions that we can test in the archaeological record. Do you have a favorite area of study within ethnography, something that you're just really passionate about? Oh gosh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really interested in understanding um, the different um, child rearing practices that different cultures employ. Um, so I study breastfeeding and weaning, and also the ways in which um, women transport their infants and how that helps them balance their work activities and caring for their offspring. What did you want to be when you were little and how does that compare to what you're doing today? Um, so according to my parents, I spent a lot of time in the garden excavating and bringing <laughs> in uh, non-cultural artifacts that I believe were very important discoveries. The artifacts? Uh, yeah, I will. Yeah, yeah, like little rocks <laughs> that I would wash off in the sink. Um, but I don't think that I ever um, conceptualized archaeology as like a feasible career because um, I there was nobody that I could really look to who was making that their career and I think at that time also um, it was very common perception that men do archaeology um, and so my first class freshman year I took archaeology and I was totally hooked um, and uh, my dad happened to know an archaeologist and so helped me uh, have the opportunity to sit down with him and talk and learn what I needed to do to make a career in it. In a male-dominated career field like in geosciences, how do you feel like your work is impacting the scientific community for women that want to go into this kind of a field? I think with any field, anytime you increase its diversity, you have new people asking new questions that might have more salience to their lives than the questions that have been <laughs> traditionally asked by white men. Um, so one of the things that has been really common in anthropology generally and archaeology specifically is that um, there's been a big focus on men's hunting and the importance of men in societies um, and incorporating more women um, and people with other varying identities um, has really opened up the amount of questions that are asked and it turns out when you ask those questions you gain important insights <laughs> about what life was like in the past when you pay attention to women and children um, and in stratified societies you start paying attention to uh, not just the elite people in those societies, you learn a lot more. In the cultures that you study in the American Southwest, as I understand it, there were a lot of matriarchal societies. How do we see a difference between matriarchal and patriarchal societies in the cultures that you studied? Um, like how do we identify that in archaeological populations? Can we see the differences between a matriarchal and a patriarchal society in the anthropological or archaeological records? Yes, um, this is, might get very technical, <laughs> <laughs> so feel free to edit it out. Um, so um, uh, you referenced the Southwest, but one of the areas where I've done most of my archaeological work is in California. Um, and we can see changes through time in California um, about uh, what we call postmarital residence pattern, and we can infer um, kinship systems from that. Um, so I'm talking about how people move after marriage to be with one family or another. So in, typically in a patriarchal society, 
a, a newly married woman will go live with her husband's family um, and vice versa for matriarchal. So the man goes to live with the woman's family and there are different advantages to both. Um, and so oftentimes in societies where women's contributions are really central to the subsistence economy and you um, don't necessarily have a really high need for territorial defense or, you know, all the violent things men do together, <laughs> um, you tend to um, have a, a high value on keeping women in their natal communities. And we can look at that archaeologically um, by doing uh, isotopic analysis where we have permission from descendant communities where we will track um, using uh, uh, isotopes like strontium or oxygen, which are indicative of the environment that somebody was living in that gets incorporated into their body. And we can look at um, the, these isotopes in their bone and teeth and track how they move throughout their life. Um, so if somebody spent their childhood in one place and then all of a sudden in early adulthood we see this dramatic shift in where they were living, we can infer that they may have moved for a uh, marriage opportunity. Um, and so if you look at a population and you see, oh wow, we see the shift in predominantly men, then we can infer that men are moving for marriage as opposed to women. Um, and in the work I've done where I um, look at how parents are investing in their offspring, um, often in societies that we believe are uh, natural local, women are breastfed longer. Um, so parents are investing more in their female offspring. Um, you also tend to see um, greater opportunities for wealth and status acquisition for women in societies uh, where they are staying in their natal communities. I know that you do so much work for the museum and I don't think we could sit here long enough for me to go into every piece of your job. It's so involved and it's so important to the scientific community and to the general population. But I would like to get to know you, Alex, as a person, more than just a scientist, more than just our ethnographer, I want to get to know you. So we will be playing a game. It is 60 seconds, all the faves. You will have exactly 60 seconds to answer these rapid fire favorites questions off the top of your head. No okay. thinking about it, gut reactions. Are you ready? Okay, let's do it. Ready? Yes. Set, go. Favorite food? Pho. Favorite color? Turquoise. Favorite vacation? Uh, the Big Island of Hawaii. Favorite item in the anthropology collections? Uh, cradles. Favorite item on display in the galleries? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sandals. Favorite way to spend your weekend? Running. Favorite thing to do when you feel stressed? Running. <laughs> Favorite accomplishment in your career so far? Oh, gosh. Um, I think it would have to be uh, beginning to graduate graduate students. Favorite research, oh my gosh, favorite research study that you've conducted? Um, studies on weaning in prehistoric populations. Favorite distinctly human behavior? Ooh. Um, that's really hard. Okay. <laughs> it turns out so many animals do so many similar things. All right, time is up. Thank you so much for that. I loved getting to know you on a little bit deeper level there. <laughs> Our theme for behind the scenes this year is resilience. In what ways do we see resilience in the cultures that you study? So I think a big, a huge impact on native cultures was uh, colonization by the Spanish and Euro-Americans. Um, and so uh, seeing how societies responded to this trauma um, and persisted, I think is very cool. Um, and our, our collection illustrates that well. I think we have lots of examples of cultural continuity from prehistory uh, to the modern era, um, demonstrating the, the maintenance of important cultural traditions. Um, and I think as I alluded to earlier, I'm really interested in cradle technology, which is, um, uh, North American indigenous cradle technology is pretty unique worldwide. And despite efforts of Americans, um, Canadians, uh, the Spanish to um, eradicate uh, native child rearing practices through things like boarding schools, um, forcible sterilizations, um, that um, native people have really 
shown resilience in the face of this by persisting in um, maintaining this cultural tradition uh, involving child rearing. And I think that's really beautiful. Have all your studies and research projects lined up exactly how you hypothesized, or have there been any big curveballs that science has thrown you for? Gosh, I think um, the study that has presented the most challenges has been um, our, our prehistoric sandal project where we're um, trying to reconstruct um, running and walking biomechanics of uh, ancestral Puebloans especially, but um, generally uh, Western North Americans by looking at use wear on sandals. And we're doing that by um, reconstructing these sandals. There's a, a woman who's an expert in doing this. She's a Santa Clara Pueblo um, citizen. And uh, she's also an archeologist. So she has come up with uh, the methods to replicate these sandals. So we, uh, COVID sort of sidelined this visit, but we learned from her how to make these sandals. And uh, uh, in collaboration with um, members in the med school, um, faculty members in the med school, uh, we're running a human subject study where we have minimalist runners running on instrumented treadmills with motion capture technology um, to better understand how this footwear affects biomechanics and how running and walking would cause wear on these sandals. And then we can look at the 3D scans we've done of like the 350 sandals we have in our collection um, and compare and see if we can see evidence of running and walking um, in these. Uh, because running is uh, a really important practice sort of across many domains in Native American culture. Um, it's important for um, ceremonies, it's important for communication, it's important uh, in coming of age ceremonies. And we know this ethnographically, but there's not really a good way of looking at it prehistorically. Um, but as an archaeologist, I'm not used to working with human subject studies, so it's been a big adventure um, doing this project uh, with med school colleagues and, and recruiting runners. It's been fun and interesting. There's always, you know, an element of surprise that can happen with individual humans and human subjects and studies, and so I know that that poses a, yeah. a really big influence to your study. Yeah, and I think one of the maybe it's the silliest thing, is figuring out how to articulate cutting edge um, medical technology for, for measuring things with prehistoric technology. <laughs> so how do you put together a replica of a prehistoric sandal with a, a cutting edge um, instrumented insole? Like how does that work and how do you put it on a subject's foot? <laughs> you mentioned minimalist running. Mm -hmm. what, what is that? Um, so that's a contemporary phrase um, that refers to people who choose to run uh, with very minimally supportive or no footwear. Um, and that trend really got started um, as a result uh, first of um, anthropologist Dan Lieberman's work um, looking at anthropological populations who um, run barefoot or with like recycled tire tread shoes. Um, and then there was a, a popular book, Born to Run, um, which is fraught with misunderstandings about uh, human evolution um, and minimalist running. Um, but it became a really big trend in the early to mid 2000s. Um, but we do know that prehistorically folks were, were running either barefoot barefoot or in shoes made of natural fiber, so like yucca fiber sandals or moccasins. Yeah. Um, and so the data we have from research like Dan Lieberman is often looking at strictly barefoot running or people running in these like tire tread shoes, which is different than we know the footwear was for people in Western North America. So we wanted to see what that was like. <laughs> If somebody wanted to pursue a career in ethnography or anthropology or archaeology, where would you recommend that they start? At the University of Utah Anthropology Department, of yes. course. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, there are many wonderful departments across the country, um, although we have a great one here. Um, I would say don't be afraid to reach out to faculty members or professional archaeologists or anthropologists um, because we are jazzed about what we do and like to share it. Um, and we're always looking for undergraduate and graduate student assistance for our research um, and are often generally just happy to talk about our research. So.
Before we wrap up, can we have a little sneak peek about something you might be working on right now? Okay, so right now I have a team of undergraduate students supervised by one of my graduate students, Haley Kiedemann, um, who are working on sorting hundreds of pounds of Gamble Oak acorns. Um, and those were gathered a couple weekends ago um, by some participants who are part of a study helping us understand how different cradle technology helps foraging mothers balance infant care and work. So we're trying to understand um, does this technology help women burn less calories? Uh, does it help them gather more calories um, compared to other baby carrying technologies? Uh, and so uh, one side of that was measuring uh, directly using mobile respirometers the calories that women burn while they're doing these activities. And the other side of that is actually counting the calories that they gathered. Um, so we're going to remove all of the non-edible parts of the acorns so we can weigh only the edible parts of the acorns. Um, and we now know using bomb calorimetry what the values of um, gamble oak acorns are. So we can say, well, this person burned this number of calories uh, using this technology, and they gathered this many calories while they were doing that. Wow, that sounds so interesting. Yeah, and I think it's really important to understand uh, how women's uh, work relates to balancing infant care, because a lot of times, as we talked about before, the focus has really been on men's hunting and not women's contributions and the technologies they're using. So. I actually had the opportunity to be one of those human subjects and participate in the foraging and it was so interesting being able to work with you and see you in your element. I absolutely loved that. Field work is so important, especially in these types of careers um, and I want to thank you for letting me be able to be a part of that and I want to thank you for sitting down with me today. I love getting to know you a little bit better uh, and I'm excited to see some of your work in the future. Thank you. Out of curiosity, did you yes. prefer foraging with your fake baby in a cradle or your fake baby in a sling? I, unsurprisingly, preferred foraging with my baby in a cradle. Using cradle technology literally changed the game. <laughs> I didn't have a baby strapped to me that I had to hold on to. I could just put the baby down and live my life. And that is, that is how I strive to be a parent someday. <laughs> put the baby down. Put the baby down, live my life. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yes. <laughs> I want that on the record that I would be a great parent. Anyway. We should clarify that you put the baby down and remain in close proximity. Yes, yeah. I was, I, I was making eye contact with the baby the whole time, and it was fine. There were some acorns that fell on baby's head, but I figured that was fine. They were just helping the process. They were white. <laughs> Thank you so much for sitting down in this hot seat interview with me. I hope you had a lot of fun. I know that I did. Well, thanks for chatting. Of course. We'll see you next time. Yes. 